Hey ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the channel. As always, it is Nick here, back to your daily crypto news and analysis. And today we are going to be talking about Quant Network, aka Q&T. So with that being said, I hope that you are all having a beautiful day or a beautiful night wherever you guys are out there in the world. So let's tap into a few things because I've been hearing a lot of bearish FUD about Quant and Q&T, the team's dumping tokens, the team hasn't pushed an update on their X page in a while, they're not doing anything, blah, blah, blah. And it's crazy to me because it's, it's the same repetitive thing that I see every single time in the space. LCX, back in October, bearish post after bearish post if you were buying in october when all those bearish posts were getting posted you are in significant profit from four cents all the way up to like 30 plus cents it was incredible h bar fud 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 all of a sudden h bar is up 70 percent in like a month not even casper ipw fud all of a sudden casper's up significantly and now the same is going on with Q&T, where everyone is fudding it, everyone's talking down on it, and it's almost as if they forget where we are at right now with Quant and even with the altcoin cycle. They're forgetting where we are at now in this cycle, and they're forgetting what's behind Quant as well. So let's talk about it. So first off, let's talk about the chart. So this is the overall chart. Now, once we get a significant break above this on the weekly, and we get a close above this as well, it's game over. It's game over. We'll probably have something like this where we back test the trend line before the next big move to the upside. Obviously, the first thing is clearing this resistance going all the way back to October of 2022, which is like right around roughly $192. But after that point, there really isn't much stopping us until we get to around roughly $270. Now, yes, we still have to be cautious of wicks here. Like, for example, this candle wick to $228. But once we break over this high, nothing is stopping Q&T from retargeting its all-time highs. And I do think that it will go significantly higher. I've talked about it, right? Like $1,000 plus a coin will happen. Is it going to happen this cycle? I believe so. But this chart looks absolutely beautiful. My demand zone down there in green, you could even bump this up a little bit if you wanted to, but this is where I have been buying Q&T every single time that we tap it, and so far, it's been doing very, very well for me. I mean, realistically speaking, anywhere between $84 to $100 on Q&T is a screaming buy zone, but even around $105, it has been insignificant profit multiple times over. And I do continue to focus on Q&T while it's continuing to squeeze between this wedge because the more that we squeeze here, the higher we go to the upside. And that's when everything around Q&T suddenly stops. All the FUD around Q&T stops. Everyone's now watching Q&T heavily. They're talking about how, oh, I was in Q&T since this time, that time I was buying Q&T, blah, blah, blah. Even though 99% of them, they weren't doing anything. They were sitting there fighting their own bags and they were sold, selling out of Q&T and chasing the next big green thing, which was probably a meme coin. It happens every single time. Now, regardless of that, over here from Mind Crypto, big shout out to Mind Crypto underscore, we have QT. This wallet has started accumulating again. It's second transaction after a month's pause. Coinbase to private wallet of 4,561 total value, $535,000 buys for QT. Whales are accumulating QT. And many believe the big players aren't accumulating. No outflows only holds Q&T. Look at this. One month ago, added $140,000. Now, just recently, added $535,000. Absolutely insane. And even going back to February, we saw the same exact buys from that same account, right? But this is not where the buying ends. There's also this whale. And big shout to Tokenizer for this. We have... The 0x629 wallets now add it 16,977 QNT in the span of 10 days. That's $2 million plus to a wallet holding nothing besides QNT and has been accumulating since August of 2021. New holding amount, 27,156 QNT valued at 3.3 million dollars 
things with these Coinbase institutional wallets are heating up. And yes, this is why I say, while everyone in the retail sector is starting to get bearish and talking about how, oh, you know, QNT is doing this, QNT is doing that, I'd rather be holding this, and you start seeing people selling and people completely forgetting about QNT, that's typically the best time that you want to start focusing up and realizing what you actually hold. QNT is starting to see whale activity yet again, and it's at a time where we are squeezing, and these whales know it. They know that we're squeezing here, and a big move is brewing. It could happen at any moment. The end of this trend line ends around roughly the end of May. Now, does that mean that we have to wait until May? I don't believe so. Things like this could happen at any moment. We could have a breakout tomorrow on this chart. But regardless, that's the time frame. Big shout out to uh, Martin Heisberg from Uphold. He actually posted an article and it says 2024 is the year of institutional adoption. This is q and This got posted on March 10th. If we go over here, we have blockchain in 2024, the year of institutional adoption. And we have Gilbert Verdian, founder and chief executive officer at Quant. Last year, it was more important than ever to distinguish crypto from the technology that powers it. And they even do mention how 2023 was uh, tumultuous for cryptocurrencies with the heads of several high profile ex exchanges facing criminal proceedings and the UK government announcing its plans to regulate the industry. Blockchain technology continued its path towards broader use because the technology will always win uh, with more successful central bank digital currency experiments and the launch of prominent commercial bank digital coins. Our prediction for 2024 is that it will be the year of widespread institutional adoption of this transformative technology. And then they do also mention CBDC. So for the rest of this video, I actually do want to focus on uh, CBDC initiatives because they are not slowing down. Uh, we have here that the momentum behind CBDC adoption remains strong in 2023 with several of the world's largest central banks and monetary authorities seeking advice on how to successfully implement CBDCs. According to the Bank for International Settlements, it is expected that there could be as many as 15 retail and nine wholesale CBDCs in circulation by 2030. Research has also found that 130 countries are now in the explorative phase of CBDCs and all G20 countries except Argentina are now in the advanced phases. The uptake in CBDCs represents a uh, in the way financial institutions and governments perceive uh, digital currencies, and we can expect to see further implementation throughout 2024. Now, down here we have, it's clear the introduction of CBDCs is inevitable, but to succeed, commercial and wholesale banks must have the infrastructure in place to support this transition. And that is where we really kind of focus on interoperability as a service. We talk about the underlying uh, foundation. We know that Quant's playing a vital role here. I've talked about it on multiple occasions, but regardless, Regulations are starting to brew. Mika goes live at the end of this year. That's going to put a lot of pressure on the US and other major nations to push forward on regulations. Um, and then once we have that, that's going to be a major step towards implementation. We even have crypto is just the beginning or is uh, just the beginning though. In 2024, uh, we could expect further movement towards the implementation of additional regulatory frameworks, laws, and policies related to digital assets of all kinds that will spearhead the widespread adoption of blockchain technology. Far from being a burden, this kind of regulatory certainty is what most financial institutions with ambitions uh, in digital assets are crying out for. It's now clear to all involved the industry needs regulation. Now, once we start to have that regulation realized in it's game over now we have down here however whilst 2023 saw progress within the standardization of blockchain technology such as iso tc307 which is created by quant um, and other standard setting organizations such as the ietf uh, there is more to be done by bringing together and combining existing standards and a framework to create a blueprint for the industry the need for interoperability is crucial here as well so as the introduction of blockchain standards comes into play so the need for truly interoperable solutions that allow for the seamless transfer of assets in 2024 we can expect to see improved communication between new and existing blockchains as part of a shift towards building an intertwined ecosystem. There will be a real emphasis on cross-chain compatibility to allow for frictionless asset transfer between different networks. And that is where we really look at what Quant has been doing because it's not around bridges, right? Like bridges have been hacked so many times in this space you have to focus on the true interoperability standard, and Quant is that. In 2024, the blockchain sector will experience a new era of maturity as a result of tighter regulation and widespread institutional adoption. However, success is reliant upon a commitment to ensuring any projects or solutions prioritize security, compliance, and trust. Those that can achieve this will be the ones who reap the benefits of this technology in 2024 and beyond, and Quant is one of those companies. And you know what's funny about this? Almost every single major project or player in the space now is talking in the 
same exact light. They're addressing how institutional adoption is here. They're addressing how regulations, compliance, making sure that you are on par with what you're doing is all vital for success. That's why I look at a lot of these projects while the retail sector FUDs them and I'm like, do they not see it? Do they, do they not realize what's happening? Like for example, right? As we see CBDC discussions uh, being talked about heavily, over here, February 19th, this was the last post by Quant, by the way, as part of Project Rosalind, we proved that overledger APIs could play a key role in enabling CBDC systems to deliver a range of benefits regarding payments, functionality, and security. Check this out real quick. There's been a lot of theory done on CBDCs. There's been a lot of economic analysis, but this was the first time they're actually testing it with real applications, real payments, and real use cases that represented what people in businesses use. And I do apologize if this is too fast. I'm just trying to speed it up uh, so that YouTube actually doesn't flag it and mute this video in, in, in full. Hopefully they don't, but who knows with how annoying uh, YouTube has been lately. Project Rosalind's objectives were for the Bank of England and the Bank of International Settlement to understand what a CBDC means for banks, institutions, payment organizations, and fintechs in a real world setting. We actually created a new form of money. We were able to create a new form of escrow, a digital escrow. We saw firsthand participants like the Central Bank of Canada, Amazon, Barclays, MasterCard, use this innovative escrow technology that we built to create new types of payments and new types of flows. What made Project Rosalind so successful was that it was very, very driven by, by end users. They engaged the API users and some, some big folks and some small folks early on and continuously throughout the project, and they still are doing. And that focus on what is it that end users want, why will they find it useful, actually is a massive contributor to project success, right? It, it, it means there's a reason for the project to happen, which is not the case with all blockchain projects. It was very, very iterative. Every week we were coming up with new requirements, every week we were producing new demos, and we had really strong participation from, from the Bank of England, from BIS, from everybody. And the project was like an absolute dream, right? It was the best project we've worked on. It was truly agile. We're receiving requirements, shipping a build, receiving feedback from users within a two-week span. It's something that not, you don't get very often in projects or products that you're getting user feedback within two weeks of getting the requirements. So that by itself was, was exhilarating. Quant's technology for Project Rosalind essentially provides the technological foundation of the entire project itself. A big part of our contribution to that was Overledger, um, our technology, and that made everything much smoother and much faster. If we'd been building against a regular blockchain um, and integrating with it directly, we would never have been able to do it in six months. The whole idea of Project Rosalind was to create a whole bunch of APIs that businesses and banks could use to interact with CBCs. Those APIs actually talk to Overledger and interact with the blockchain via Overledger. So we literally provide the technological foundation for interacting with blockchain. The other area where we contributed a lot was in our smart contract expertise. We built the smart contracts for this, which are quite complex central bank digital currency smart contracts, and that's a kind of a credit to the folks on our tech team. The main challenges in Project Rosalind were around kind of defining exactly what do we mean by a CBDC, right? So there's a lot of different ways that you can do that. It could be decentralized, it could be centralized, and so some of those big decisions um, needed to happen quite early on. The other challenge that we had was um, around offline payments. Offline payments are just technically difficult, and it took us longer than we expected to work through how that works. We were successful in the end, but it took a while. We had so many different requirements to cater for um, and taking those diverse requirements and diverse use cases and boiling that down into a simple set of APIs that would suit everyone um, was a design challenge in itself. To then take those APIs and build them rapidly um, was a fun challenge, but a challenge nonetheless. The learning outcomes from this project for us were, have been really quite transformative. So there was the big thing with uh, retail CBDC is, so what? Right? I mean, what's the point of this? And Project Rosalind came up with some really, really good answers to that, um, which were kind of collaborative through the whole process. Um, but actually they've, they've given us a lot of clarity in terms of how that should work and that's, that's affected some of our other propositions. We have kind of laid the groundwork for how Quant wants to do projects going forward. There was a huge amount of collaboration and it was an absolute joy to work with everybody, plus internally within our teams. It challenged us to work quicker uh, and collaborate internally within Quant as well. Um, so honestly, it was a joy. Now, with all that information in mind, considering the fact that they were working with the BIS and also the Bank of England on Project Rosalind, that's a very significant thing to know. Right, all of that information, everything that they mentioned, all the API, uh, a, a, API calls, the offline payments, they did everything, and it was all through Overledger. Now everyone will say, "Oh, QNT is not utilized." Guys, Overledger, everything that happens on Overledger is utilizing QNT. QNT is vital for that. But why am I bringing all this back up? Well, it's because. Just recently, the BIS put out a report on March 7th, and it is regarding fast payments. They are the key innovation that have set, or sorry, seen mass adoption in some jurisdictions, but not in others. Adoption may be higher when certain design features are present, and we could actually see the volume of fast payment transactions and how they have grown rapidly. Now, in this document, 
where it says fast payments design and adoption, we get this section here titled infrastructure or AKA the underlying plumbing, i.e. the systems and technology that enable the provision of fast payments to end users. This was all regarding APIs, connecting APIs, making sure that they have that functionality in place and the security regarding payments. And if we scroll down to that bottom part, apart from the settlement system, various other types of in infrastructure are key to the functioning of an FPS, a faster payment system. These may be additional systems like proxy databases, which are responsible for enabling um, aliases. Additionally, FPS or faster payment systems may also rely on messaging standards like ISO 2022 or API standards for communication between PSPs. Auxiliary infrastructure such as cloud computing can also be important to provide uh, scalability for the delivery of fast payments. When we look at APIs, APIs are the key thing that I'm really looking at. But we are now starting to see an entire new settlement system uh, being created. It's all being tapped in with you know DLT, APIs, ISO 2022 reliant payment uh, messaging systems. Like all of this is crucial to understand at this time, because when we look at some of the companies around this space, like uh, like Quant and what they've been building, you know, it's it's something very significant to take notice of. And the fact that they worked with the BIS on a lot of these APIs, you know, it, it's a big deal. And it's something very large to know when we are talking about the future regarding payments and finance. Listen, I think at this point in time, anyone that is uh, denying the fact that blockchain DLT and a lot of these projects within the space and companies within the space, you know, are going to be a part of this new system and they're denying that, I don't know where they've been. I don't know what information that they've been reading. But at this point in time, the BIS, the IMF, all of these organizations that are pulling the strings, every single one of them are mentioning blockchain, DLT, APIs. They're even collaborating with companies like Quant and Ripple. And it's insane to me that people are still not seeing the end goal here. They're just looking at price action. They're just looking at something and they're saying, oh, well, you know, that 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 completely defies everything that Quant has been doing. All that's noise. It's nonsense. q and is not going to do anything. I'd rather buy Shiba Inu. It's insane to me. But with that being said, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you guys did, definitely leave a like, subscribe, turn notifications on if you guys have more free content. If you guys are more than welcome to follow me on Twitter and join free Discord down in the description below. And with that being said, guys, it's been Nick. Thanks for watching. Peace out.